Now, information in the sensory register that is attended to um, gets transferred into short-term memory. Now, the function of short-term memory is to hold information um, which is uh, consciously available to you and that you can use for other cognitive processes that you can use for guiding behavioral output. And also, you might be able to transfer into long-term memory. Now, generally speaking, um, the sh uh, short-term memory seems to have a smaller capacity than the sensory buffer. For example, in terms of a acoustic uh, short-term memory, probably the limit has been, has been um, considered very stable at just about seven uh, items, perhaps a seven plus or minus two, as we will see shortly. In the case of visual short-term memory, that number seems to be closer to four or five, although it is, I have to say, not uncontroversial. Um, nonetheless, it does have considerably longer duration than any of the sensory buffers, being in the range of 15 to 30 uh, seconds. And now an important aspect of short-term memory in the Atkins and Schifrin's model model of memory um, is that to also regulate the inflow, so the encoding of information into long-term memory, and then the outflow, so the retrieval of information from long-term memory. In addition to that, information that is in, in short-term memory can also be rehearsed uh, in order to be maintained longer. And, and rehearsal might indeed play a part in uh, encoding into long-term memory. Finally, of course, some of the information in short-term memory, eventually, uh, possibly the information that is not rehearsed, will uh, be lost and not encoded in long-term memory. Now, with respect to the capacity of working memory, in 1956, uh, Miller wrote a landmark um, paper, or in fact, it was sort of a, the written form of an address, um, in which he reported the surprisingly stable capacity of auditory short-term memory. And he found that presenting uh, different uh, lists of letters, numbers, words to uh, participants, and then asking them to repeat them, uh, they seemed on average to always converge on um, remembering seven plus or minus two items. So the way in which he did this is that he would show, for example, the first row and then ask participants um, take the row away and then ask participants to repeat it or the second row, the third row. And as I said, generally speaking, seven seems to be uh, the average. Although again, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Now he spoke about seven plus or minus two items, but of course a very important point which he discusses is what exactly counts as an item? And see, um, this turns out to be a difficult question. Um, let me give you an example. I will, I just like to do a demo. So I will show you um, a series of letters, uh, read them, and then as soon, uh, I will, I will uh, take them off the screen. And then your job is to try to report as many as you can of these letters. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Go. I want to guess that you've reported just about on average seven plus or minus two. Let's try this again. Uh, exactly the same thing, but we will look at the bottom uh, square. Ready? Three, two, one. Go. I want to guess that you probably reported either all of the digits or a good number, probably more than you have earlier. And have you, as you've noticed, the reason for this is that uh, in the first, in fact, notice that the top series and the bottom series are exactly the same letters. I've simply moved, I've shifted them 
by two. So if you start from here, I, B, M, C, B, S, N, B, C, it's exactly the same letters. But because I shifted them around a little bit, they don't form these nice acronyms that they form down here that, are, that, you, that you already know. And so here you're encoding the, I, the seven plus or minus two items tend, tend to be letters because these letters don't group into any meaningful way to you. Whereas these letters, even though it's the exact same letters, here they clearly group into meaningful uh, units. Uh, and so rather than encoding an I, then a B, then an M, then a C, then a B, you, as you did up here, you pro down here you probably encoded IBM, CBS, NBC, GOP, BLT, etc. So you've um, you've you've memorized, or rather, you could report twenty-one letters. Here you could only report seven. Here you could report twenty-one because they organized in seven meaningful units. Now we typically refer to these units as chunks. So short-term memory doesn't have a capacity of seven plus or minus two, you know, letters, digits, or it has a, a capacity of seven plus or minus two chunks, where a chunk is really any combination of letter, digits, numbers, whatever uh, the case, uh, that make a meaningful unit. Um, and indeed, the, the capacity to chunk information into these greater units uh, depends on engaging uh, processes from long-term memory, where patterns that you're already familiar with can be imposed on these combinations and give meaning on these combinations. One nice example of application of this are so-called professional um, mnemonists. So these are these are people who you know will will, will memorize um, uh, will memorize the um, decimals of pi down to some crazy order. See, it turns out it's not that they have better memory than you and I ha uh, have. They just are extremely skilled at forming large chunks. So they don't remember every digit. What they remember is chunks. And then once you know the chunk, you know what is in there, right? So if I were to say CBS, it's a chunk, you know exactly the letters that go in there. So once you remember the chunk, you can then access the information, i.e. the letters. In the same way, mnemonists tend to um, uh, learn chunks. And then once you learn the chunk, it's easy to recover the digits that make that chunk up. Now, interestingly, a, a similar limit in capacity of short-term memory has also been studied in the context, in the context of visual short-term memory, or VSTM. Um, and, and this was uh, shown generally with a task known as change detection task. And the task goes more or less like this. Uh, you're shown a screen for 100 milliseconds, so a pretty quick flicker. Um, then there's a gap, uh, which uh, can be variable, but for example, at 900 milliseconds. And then after that gap, you see a second flicker of screen that also has um, similar objects as the first one but some have changed and some has not. And your job is to detect how many, uh, and if any, and which have changed. For example, if you look at this display, um, you might want to find out that I think there's one change. I won't tell you which, but I think there's one change. So when you do this um, and you see uh, how many times people get, get the change correctly, it turns out that once you exceed four items, uh, people stop doing particularly well. So this has led, although not uncontroversially, um, to the general agreement that um, visual short-term memory seems to have a capacity somewhere between four and five items. Now, much like in the context of acoustic uh, short-term memory, also in visual short-term memory, you can use chunking uh, to make um, bits uh, into meaningful chunks. And one wonderful example uh, was by Chase uh, and Simon in 1973. Now, now they were interested in expertise. Uh, 
in the role of expertise. And what they did is they took, um, uh, they took some chess masters and some novices, and they showed them boards um, with pieces in various positions. And they asked them to memorize, they, they had them study the board for some amount of time and then asked them to, um, um, you know, to report where were the positions of each piece. Um, now, the interesting uh, aspect to this is that um, um, masters, chess masters did much, much, much better than beginners. In fact, beginners, exactly as you'd expect, could typically report for um, for um, four pieces, the position correctly of four pieces, exactly the limit of, of a visual shirt of memory. On the other hand, masters could report up to 16. Um, however, here's the very clever trick. If instead of placing the pieces um, in the positions that they would be in, in real games, so these would be boards taken from real games, if instead you just place the pieces randomly on the board, instead of sort of putting them in a, in a realistic position, now the masters are exactly like novices. So it's not that masters have a particularly good, um, a particularly good memory or a particularly strong memory. Probably what's happening, the likely explanation, is that masters used chunking to memorize the position of the pieces and do very well. So when you look at the realistic board, uh, now you and I might see, you know, pawn, 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 rook, uh, bishop, et cetera, et cetera. But, but maybe a master instead, you know, looks at this and sees the Alban counter gambit or the Sicilian defense, the Siberian trap, the the Italian trap or whatever else exists in the world of chess. So once you know that you know these uh, these six um, these six pieces make up the I don't know something trap. <laughs> I'm not a big chess player. Um, you don't need to remember the position of each individual um, piece. You know it by knowing what that configuration is. And so by virtue of doing that, much like you could re suddenly remember 21 letters just by chunking letters into meaningful units, those acronyms, um, then chess masters can remember um, 16 pieces by chunking them into you know, a, few, um, a few configurations. And of course, proof is that as soon as you give them random uh, chess layouts, uh, where these pieces are not amenable to being chunked in a meaningful way because they're randomly positioned, then chess masters do exactly as uh, novices. An interesting question is what is the duration of shorter memory? Now, at least theoretically, uh, if you were rehearsing the contents of your shorter memory, I imagine that it could last forever. Um, however, an interesting question is some sensory input arrives. Uh, it enters your sensory register. You allocate attention to it. It enters short-term memory. In the absence of any rehearsing, for how long is that information going to stay there before it fades away? Now, Peterson was one of the first to ask these questions in 1959. And he did the following. He gave participants a trigram, which means three letters. And then right after, he would give them a, a number, a random number, and he'd ask them to count backwards by three. The intention behind this uh, approach is that by giving you the task of counting backwards by three, you're, you're being prevented from rehearsing. And then what, what uh, Peterson would do, um, uh, he would let participants go for a different amount of times, stop them, and ask them for the trigram. So this way, he could see if the trigram, after a certain amount of time without the benefit of, of uh, rehearsal, uh, would still be available. Turns out, on average, without rehearsal, 
more or less 15 seconds um, is close to the maximum. It can be longer than that according to certain uh, things, but 15 seconds is a good average of how long uh, it can be. As I said, it could be longer, uh, sometimes significantly, uh, but 15 seconds is a good average, particularly in the, in, in the study, of just how long something can stay in your short-term memory before it fades off.